All right, hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. How many excited to be in God's house today? Hey, man, I'm excited you're here as well. We're in part two of a series we're calling Turbulence. How many ever have flown on a plane and experienced some crazy turbulence? You know, crazy turbulence, like freak you out turbulence. It's, if you have a good captain, what will happen in flight is they'll let you know before it even happens. The, the seatbelt light will come on and they'll tell you like, you know, it's not the time to go to the restroom, like buckle up for the next few minutes. We're going to experience a little bit of turbulence. They may even give you like a time frame of turbulence. And in this series, I kind of think for a lot of us, this is God's seatbelt sign. Like, like for some of you, this, like the lights are going off, there's signals going off, you sense it, something is, is, is wrong or off or something in your, a rhythm, a pace, especially in this season, man, in this season of holidays, as much as it is, it is about joy and cheer and all that stuff, it also is about stress and anxiety and tensions and commitments and finances and all that stuff that can really cause, it can cause turbulence. So we decided just to pause for a little bit and to, to speak to some principles of turbulence. Like how do we respond to this? How do we respond to the crazy, hectic pace, commitments, stress that many of us are experiencing, possibly even um, experiencing in this season. I do believe some signals, some signs, some seatbelt signs are going off for a lot of people, whether it's the Holy Spirit telling you, it's for some of you, your mind is starting to tell you, your emotions, your body is, is telling you, like there's just different signals going off that are saying, hey, buckle up. You're, you're heading into some, into some turbulence. And, and in this series, I want to help you see how to, how to discern the turbulence, but also how to rise above the turbulence. Because the reality is we're, we're never going to be, you know, smooth sailing all the time through life. Jesus said in, in life you will experience trouble. And so that is, that is a promise. Life is going to be full of it, man, full of troubles, full of trials, full of turbulence. So it's not like trying to divert away from all the turbulence and all the stress and anxiety. You really can't like divert away from rough times. You just have to learn how to rise above it. In fact, here's the working definition of turbulence for this series. It's the rough patch you have to go through to get where you need to be. Have you ever been through a rough patch before? Anyone ever been through a rough patch? So yeah, you know, like, like what I'm talking about there. It's, it's, it's just, maybe it was a financial thing. It was a relational thing. Maybe it was a um, some decisions you made or somebody else made. For whatever reason, though, you had to go through a rough patch. But there was no really going around it. There was no avoiding it. You have to go through some things to get to where God wants you to be. And that's what this series is, is all about. How do we handle those rough patches? How do we rise above those rough patches in the turbulent seasons that we all can experience? Here's our theme verse, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And then I'm going to show you where we're going today. It says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. How many of you love when you're going through a tough time, anyone just to tell you, just be happy? And that, like, that's almost like what I feel like God is doing here in the scripture. It's like, oh, that's not what I need right now, God. It's just rejoice. Just rejoice. Here's the answer. Just be happy. Like, oh, really? Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. All the Lord is near. Someone say the Lord is near. He's near. It may not feel like it in the middle of a turbulent season and you're going through stuff and you're white knuckling your armchair going, oh my gosh, am I going to go down? Is my marriage going to be over? Is my, are my kids ever going to get this right? Are, are, are my job and my finances? And you're white knuckling. Is it really possible to experience this, this next sentence? <laughs> Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Anything? Like, is that possible? Really, really, God, is that possible? And I don't think, I don't think that God would have put this in the scripture for us as an empty platitude, as something that was not possible. I don't think this is like an endless pursuit that you really can't obtain. I do believe that it is actually possible. I believe the word of God is true, that there's, there is available to us, and maybe some of you need like this vision in your life, you need this reality. You need to accept the possibility that there is a version of your life, of your marriage, of your future that does not include anxiety. That I can actually be anxious for 
Like not, nothing that this world does or people do. Like I can, I can rise above that. And here's how he said, in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what does it say? The peace of God that transcends. And I told you that word transcend last week is, is the Greek word is hyper echo. And it means literally to rise above. It also means to have rank, power, and authority. And so here's, here's what God is saying. Like, yes, you can be anxious for nothing. Like, nothing has that power in this world or in your life. Nothing has the power to produce inside of you anxiety if you have this ingredient, the peace of God, that causes you to not, like, be in a bubble throughout the world. No, that causes you to rise above the turbulence. That causes you, that gives you a, a power and authority and, and rank over every tension, anxiety, attack, commitment, schedule, all that stuff. Like there is a peace that God has available that can help you rise above and literally be anxious for nothing. And, and I, was, I was reading about Gen Z here recently. If you're, if you're in high school or if you're college age, you're in the Gen Z population, and, and which are phenomenal. Like, they got a lot of great attributes and contributions, and they're a very gifted generation. Man, as much f- slack and flack that some of you give that generation, they are an amazing generation. They're going to be some uh, amazing world changers. However, the studies do say that if you are Gen Z today, if you're Gen Z, where are you at? You know you're Gen Z. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, some of you, some of you, some of you don't even want to raise your hand because you're getting so much flack for it. It's okay, it's okay. Here's what studies do say, though. Studies do say about the, that kind of college age crowd, you are the most stressed out generation in history, or at least most recent history. Like there is so much anxiety that, uh, and there's a lot of contributing factors, you know, that, you know, Social media, and it's probably one of those big factors. But, but really, you stress and you worry about a lot of things. You worry about, like, what college am I going to go to? And, and what degree am I going to get? And, 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 and should I get student loans? And can I pay off my student loans? And am I going to get a job with that thing? And my job, is my job going to be able to? And, and what if I'm not going to do this? And, and what if I never find my one? And I don't find my one. And I need my one. And... and and I don't want to find the wrong one. I don't want to get stuck with a psycho. I've seen some psychos. And, and like the, my friends all got psychos. I don't want to get stuck with a psycho. And you're like, and, and some of you are already married and you're still stressed. So stress isn't just for a Gen Z. You are married. You're like, I did marry a psycho. I married a psycho. And I'm going psycho. <laughs> They're making me psycho. And, and, or, or some of you here today and your kids are driving you crazy. Or you got, you got aging parents or something like that. And you're on that end of it. The reality is like all throughout every stage of life and season of life, you're going to have some turbulence. You're going to have some anxiety. But what I want to do is kind of provide you some principles, some principles for the turbulence, man, some principles for the, for the stress. Today, I specifically want to talk to you about anxiety, though, about this anxiety, to be anxious about nothing. And, and to do that, to do that, I, I got a character I think that everyone can can kind of relate to in the Bible. He's an Old Testament prophet. He actually struggled like, like a lot of us do because he was someone who really loved God. Like he's a prophet. He loved God. He'd seen God do some amazing things and, and work in his life. He's seen God's faithfulness. He's seen God's power, his provision. Yet this prophet struggled massively with anxiety. His name is Elijah. Some of you might not know that Elijah had maybe this struggle in his lifetime, but I think that we can find a lot of connection to him today. Let me set up where we're going today, the context of, of the, the portion of First Kings that we're going to be studying. In Elijah's like, lifetime, he was a prophet called to preach the gospel and declare God's will to the nation. And, and uh, at that time, king, um, it was King Ahab was the king, and he was a very sinful king. And Idol worship was reigning. He was leading the people of God astray. So Elijah actually spoke into that, and he called out the king on his sin, on his idolatry, on his own individual personal sin as well. And that really ticked off King Ahab. And so King Ahab, like, throughout Elijah's life was pursued by him. Ahab wanted to kill Elijah, 
And so he, but it was a weird relationship because Ahab kind of feared Elijah a little bit because he knows the power that Elijah had and the miracles that Elijah had done, yet he was still trying to kill him. At one point, Elijah runs for his life and talk about seeing God do miracles. Like he was fed manna and meat from ravens. Ravens came and brought him meals. He was, he was used by God to resurrect the dead. Like this guy had seen God's power. At one point, he stood one against 850 false prophets of Baal. Some of you remember this story. It was one against 850. He's standing toe to toe with all these guys, and he calls down the fire of heaven and kills and consumes 850 false prophets. I mean, amazing, just powerful stuff. But here's what happens right after that occurrence. King Ahab's wife, Jezebel, sends a ladder out and, you know, gets Elijah's attention. He, she, kind of, she threatens him. Here's this Elijah experiencing nonstop protection, provision, presence, power. And this woman, Jezebel, she goes, look, if you got to get something done right, send a woman to do it. Ahab, get out the way, dude. I'm going to take, take care of this situation. Okay, so she steps in and she tells, she tells Elijah, like, I'm gonna, if, you know, by the end of today, I'm going to kill you. I'm coming at you. And here is Elijah who's seen the power, provision, and protection of God. One grumpy woman threatens him, and he falls apart. <laughs> and and that all, I don't know, this ain't, this ain't the message of the power of women, but I mean, <laughs> it could be, you know. But, but just here he is, and he's like, but we, we look at that, and we're like, what happened there? And there are some reasons kind of, I think, why it happened. But I want to show you today four different mistakes that Elijah made because he got to the end of his rope. He kind of got the, to the end of himself. Uh, there probably were in Elijah's life some seatbelt signals going off. There were some dings that were probably going off in Elijah's life that he just did not pay attention to. But then at the end of it, he kind of gets just to the end of his rope. He snaps and has enough. And he's there at that place, of, at, at the end of himself, when his strength is exhausted, he starts making some mistakes, which is often what happens to us. We don't like make big mistakes when we're on top of the mountain, when we're feeling great and you feel full of the word of God. You make your biggest mistakes when you're at your weakest moment. That's when you make the mistakes. And so here's Elijah. I want you to see if you can spot. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we're going to read verse 3 and 4. If you can spot the four huge mistakes that Elijah makes. Here's where it says. We're going to start in verse 3. It says, Elijah was afraid. He's freaking out. He's experiencing at this point, listen, very deep, very real anxiety. That's what is, is going on in, in Elijah's life. It's real. So he ran for his life. That's the first mistake. Running is often the, the default reaction to our stress and our anxiety. Some of you guys run into it, some of you guys run away from it, but running is one of the default reactions. And it says, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, watch this mistake, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So now he's by himself, wandering in the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and look at this, he prayed that he might die. Think of the logic of this, right? So he's being threatened with his life by Jezebel. Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. So his logic goes, oh, I'm so afraid. I'm going to kill myself. Like he's in a bad place, right? This is a dark place. You're afraid you're going to die, so you're going to kill yourself? Like so he's, he's, he's really struggling right now. And he says the same thing that probably a lot of us have said. Check this out. Look what it says. I've had enough, Lord. Have you ever said that? Have you ever gotten to that place where you said, I've had enough, Lord. I can't take it anymore, God. And so this is, this is where the, all the signals have already gone off. We've ignored the seatbelt sign, the dings, our emotions, our mind, advice from friends, the Holy Spirit, a message that you heard, whatever it is. All these signs are telling you, hey, turbulence ahead. And we've ignored it. And we get to this place at the end of ourselves that we go, I've had enough, Lord. I can't take it anymore. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Some of you about right now, you may be in that I have had enough. And I want you to know that's a signal for you. Well, there it is. There's your signal. That's, that's a sign for some of you. If you are there at that place today, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. If one more thing breaks, oh, my God. If it, it, I, I, I'm, I just, I'm at the end of myself. I, I'm trying to pay the bills. I'm trying to fix things. For some of you, it's a relationship that you're in. 
and you're trying, and you're trying, and you're trying, and then they deceived you again, and you're like, I've had enough. I can't take this in- anymore. I've-, I've-, I've had enough. For some of you, it's your schedule, and you work, and you work, and you work, and you're trying everything, and maybe you're a single parent, and you're trying to juggle, and you're working your tail off, and you just cannot take it anymore. And it could be something simple. For me, this, this message and series, you guys, is speaking to me, I told you last week, as much as it's speaking to you, okay? There was a several weeks ago that I, I it could be something simple, like, like Elijah, where it's just, you know, a threat of Jezebel that makes him fall apart after he stares down 850 prophets, you know what I mean? It could be, it often is the simple thing that, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back kind of thing. For me, a couple weeks ago, here's what it is. Can I invite you into my turbulence? For a moment, okay? Is it okay if your pastor isn't perfect? Is that okay? Is everybody okay with that? So uh, several weeks ago, for me, the small thing it was, was the laundry. Who knows? You know my pain. Some of you know my pain. It's the, here's the thing. It's never ending. It never stops. And the moment I feel like I got on top of it, here it comes again. And I'm at this place where it's, it's really not the laundry. It really is just a manifestation that some other things that were out of alignment in my life. And I, I find myself, you know, this laundry is doing something. I'm like, I'm creating scenarios. I'm like theology in this thing. I'm like, I'm like, this laundry is not of God. It's not of God. And I'm like, in the Garden of Eden, we didn't even have clothes, okay? What's the deal with this, man? This is a sign of the curse. And here I am rebuking laundry now. Like, this is a... We, I'm in a bad place, y'all. This is not good. I'm not in a good place, and the laundry's just a man. Of, I'm, I'm short-tempered. I'm mean now. I'm like, and it isn't the laundry. It's other things I let get out of alignment in my life. It just is the never-ending story. I found this meme. I wanted to show you 80s, 90s kids. Maybe you, maybe you, how many of you remember the never-ending story as a kid? All right. Here's your never-ending story as an adult. How many of you know that's right? It's the never-ending story. Laundry. <laughs> or, I mean, that's what it is for me. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe for some of you, like you've cooked 9,000 meals for your kids, you know? And I have made 9,000 dinners and they're still ungrateful. <laughs> or they complain about it or don't eat it, you know what I mean? And it's like, you're like, at 9,000, I've cooked 9,000 meals, but at 9,001, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> I'm going to kill them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> And God is going to be so pleased with this because their sin will have found them out. That's what's happening here. And so I don't know what it is for you, but it's, often, it's those little things often that will, but it's not that. It's not that. It's not the little thing. That's just, it's just a manifestation of an alignment issue of some signals that we didn't catch. The seatbelt sign, the alarms were going off, and really we didn't catch it. And therefore now we're just kind of tripping all over ourselves. We're making some bad decisions now. Because we didn't heed the turbulent signal, okay? So let me give you the, the four mistakes that we can make in this place of, I've had enough. You ever get to this place where, oh, I've had enough, man, you're going you're gonna to end up making the same mistakes Elijah did. Write some notes for me. Number one is we run ourselves into the ground. You get to this place where, where man, I just can't take it anymore. And for some of you, it's, it's, it might be different. Some of you run yourself into the ground trying to work it, work it, work it, work it, trying to get it, grind it. And, and then some of you, you just run yourself away. That's your default reaction. Either run into or run away from. But you kind of need to know your default reaction. It's one of the mistakes we make. For, for Elijah, he was, the text says he was afraid and he ran for his life to Beersheba. And if you don't know like the geography of that area, Beersheba was 100 miles away from where he was at the time. And he literally ran as, as far as humanly possible. From where he, like he could not run anymore else, he was going to run into water. He ran to the water, to the, to the edge. He ran a marathon, right? He ran, he ran, he ran until he got so exhausted he wore himself out. Some of you run away, some of you run into. Psalm chapter 127, verse 2. It says this, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night. Some of you need to, that's your, you need to memorize this verse, some of you, Okay. It is useless for you to be grinding yourself into the ground morning till night, anxiously working for food. Why? Because God is the one who's going to give you the rest you need. God gives rest to the ones he loves. So one of the mistakes we make when we come to the end of ourselves, when we get to that place, I've had enough, is we just run ourselves into the ground. Here's the second mistake he made. 
that we can often make, and that is we shut people out. We shut people out. Some of you are there right now. Some of you, you might be in a real season of anxiety, but you don't even recognize it. But you don't recognize the anxiety. You're just, you're, maybe you're so used to that, that alarm going off in your life, in your body, that you can't even recognize it. And what you may need to do is just look at some of these symptoms and mistakes you're, you're making. Here's, not only Elijah, like, did he run himself into the ground, but he, the second big mistake he made that a lot of people do is he shut people out. He, his, he left his servant, his most trusted ally, his most trusted friend. He said, look, I don't need you anymore. You stay over here, I'm going off alone. How many times, especially you guys, do we do that when we're struggling? We're struggling, we're hurting, we don't let anybody know. Don't let anybody know that I'm hurting, don't let anybody know that I'm bleeding, don't let nobody know that I'm anxious or have stress. I can't let nobody see me sweat. The reality is, look, you need to have times of solitude, of alone time. You do, you need that, but you can't stay there. And especially when you're, when you're feeling stressed and anxious, you, you, you don't need the mountain as much as you need a brother or a sister, okay? In fact, Matthew chapter 14, 23, Jesus had this practice that he would separate himself, and I'm going to show it to you. It said when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. How I many you know you need to do that? You need to, set, you need to get away from the multitudes every now and then to get alone and pray. It says when he even came, he was there all alone, and that's okay, to get to that, you need to have that rhythm to get to that place where you're alone. But when you are, when you're in turbulence, you can't stay on the mountain. You can't stay alone. Where you're I'm not gonna tell anybody that I'm hurting. I'm just gonna push through on my own and I'm not gonna let anybody in. This is one of the reasons why we have groups here at Discovery Church. If you're not in a group, I'm telling you, you need, you're going to, you're gonna have engine failure to the turbulence. You need to get in community and get into a small group. They're the heartbeat of Discovery Church. Here you may want to write this extra note down. The danger of isolation is much greater than the risk of intimacy. Okay? Some of you don't want to let people in. You're afraid of letting them into that intimate place, that vulnerable space of, yeah, I get it. That's scary to invite somebody into the real you, to the real stress, to the real problem, to the real pain. I get that's scary. But the danger of inviting people into that space is not as much as the danger of you staying in isolation. Okay? So we shut people out. We run ourselves into the ground. Here's the next thing that we do. The third mistake is we focus on the negative. How many ever get to that place? That's where I was, right? Just looking at things with the wrong perspective, man. And now you're just like, everything is wrong. Everything is off. Here's what he said. He said, I've had enough. I'm no better than my father's. I'm no better than my ancestors. And this is the very thing we do. We focus on the negative. Here's why this is so important. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Be careful how you think because your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life is shaped by what you're thinking about. So if you're thinking, oh, my life is so hard, guess what? You're going to have a hard time in life. Oh, my life is so hard. I'll never get it all done. Guess what? You probably won't. If you keep thinking that way, you probably won't. I'll never get it all done. Uh, There's just too much. I can't stand these people. My job is too hard. Honey, we'll never get this right. We'll never be able to fix the broken. We'll never be happy. We'll never be out of debt. We'll never be, we'll never be. You just focus all on the wrong stuff. And that's what happens when you get to the end of yourself. your, Your perspective is off. Your focus on the negative. Here's the fourth mistake we make when we're at the end of our rope, and that is we forget God. And that's what Elijah did, right? He has, is someone who's seen the power of God, saw his faithfulness and his provision, and God showed up so much for him. He'd been present. He'd been provided. He had been protecting. But Elijah did what so many of us do in our life. He was facing down his problems at the same time he was forgetting his God. And that's what we do when we're at the end of ourselves. We'll try to face down our problem alone, at the same time forgetting our God, and everything that he has done for us. Isaiah 26 and 3 says this. It's a promise. It says, you will keep, God will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are what? They're fixed on you, God. And, and, And so when we get to the end of our rope, at the end of our striving, when we get to that place where we say, I've had enough, and we didn't listen to the signals going off, we... We end up like just out of breath, running at the end. 
just exhausted, right? Which Elijah's name itself, Elijah's name should have been enough to remind him of who God was. It should have brought him comfort. Let me break down Elijah's name to you. For those of you, Elijah, L I N J. You break it down, L is short for Elohim. Okay? I is my or I, and J is Yahweh. So what, what his name means is my God is Yahweh. And translated Yahweh, you know what that means? My God is my breath. How many of you are out of breath today? How many of you out of breath, been running and grinding, and you're coming to the end of yourself, and you're just out of breath? What you, you're, Elijah, Elijah says, his name means my God is my breath. My God is my source. My God is my strength. My God is my provider, my sustainer. So I gave you turbulence principle number one last week, and that was to check your gauges, okay? If you're, you're going through turbulence, you got signs going off, you got to check the gauges, all right? Go check that message out if you miss it. But let me today give you turbulence principle number two. Check it out. Put your oxygen mask on first. Write that down. We got some people, examples. There you go. You, you ever, if you've ever been on a plane, you've heard the flight attendants, right? The flight attendants will tell you, hey, make sure that if we experience, you know, turbulence or whatever, and the oxygen masks are needed, make sure you do what with that oxygen mask? You do what? You put it on first before you help the person seated next to you. And the reason is very obvious. I can't help the person next to me if I'm passing out from a lack of oxygen. There's a very, very, I think, powerful and spiritual principle about putting on your oxygen mask first because if I am going to be used by God to make a difference in this world, to make a difference in somebody else's life, if I'm gonna be a healing agent in this world, then I gotta be whole myself. I can't be out of breath trying to give somebody else breath. I I need to... I need to breathe again. I need to get the breath of God again. I need to learn how to put my oxygen mask on first. It's not in your notes, but in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus, at the end of Matthew uh, Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? You guys remember this. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor just as you love yourself. Most believers recognize that verse. They, they, they know it like, yep, loving God, loving your neighbor. But I think what a lot of believers don't recognize, the power of the second part, the last part of loving your neighbor. Jesus said you need to love your neighbor as, as you love yourself. Okay, here's, here's, I think, what Jesus is saying. You can't really love your neighbor to the fullest if you don't love yourself. It, you, so there's got to be this, especially if I'm going to be a healing agent. I'm going to make a difference. Then, then, like Elijah, just working and grinding and moving and rolling. And just like, there's got to be where I, I breathe again, where I, where I breathe the breath of God. Allow him to be my source and my strength and my sustainer. If I'm really going to make a difference or else, I'm going to come to the end of my rope again. I'm going to get to this place of I've had enough and I can't, I can't take it anymore. You've got to, you've got to be whole. I've got to be healed physically, spiritually, emotionally. For me to make a difference in somebody else's life, I need to put my oxygen mask on first. Like Elijah, write this down if it's not in your notes. Your faith will dry up when you run on emotion instead of devotion. So that's, that's I think, what we see in Elijah. You see a lot of, I mean, God moved in his life. Obviously, it wasn't all emotion. It wasn't all, like, hype or anything. God was moving. For a lot of you, God has moved. You've seen his faithfulness. But if you don't catch your breath you're going to get to that place where you say, I've had enough. If you don't put your oxygen mask on first and learn how to do that, then you're going to always enter into turbulent seasons where you feel like you're, you're going to get taken out. We, you, you can't run on emotion. You have to learn how to run on devotion. Let me say it this way. You can choose to either run on steam or breath. Steam. You know what steam is, right? Steam is like pressure. It's hot air. Some of you are running on steam, man. You just, you, you go, you go, you go, and you get it. And then you get to the end of yourself, and you make some bad decisions. You have to take a break. You have to take a vacation, and you, you come on back to it and grind some more, steam some more, steam some more. But you never really feel rested, do you? You don't, because you're running on pressure. You're running on steam. You need to learn how to run on the breath of God. You need to learn how to catch your breath. My God is my breath. My God is my source. 
I'm telling you, if you can learn this principle to put your oxygen mask on first and not just run, 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 but put your oxygen mask on first, it's going to help you in those turbulent times. Elijah was in the middle of a massive anxiety attack, and he allowed his anxiety to, to like dictate and influence his decision so much that he's way off course. He's way off the beaten path of where God wanted him to be. He even cut some people out of his life that God intended to be a source of help in his life. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? Anybody? Okay. So this message today is for anybody that deals with stress and anxiety, which is 100% of us. <laughs> Anyone who's dealing with the stress and anxiety and how do we, how do we handle those turbulent seasons? How do, we, how do we handle it when we ignore the signals for long enough and we get to the end of ourselves? How does God handle it? How does God, how does God respond when we get to like that place where I've had enough, God, and you're just running away and you're off the beaten path and you're even making bad relationship decisions, making bad like future, you're just making bad decisions. What is, how does God respond to that? I think some of us think that God's like, oh, ye of little faith. You know, that's not at all. What God is, is doing in this situation, I want to, like, let's study what God, how God shows up in Elijah's life here. When he's at the end of his rope, there's a few things that he does, all right? And if you're today at that place where you're like, I've had enough, maybe in relationship, finances, spiritually, emotionally, somewhere, I think this is what God would say to you if you're in that turbulence today. Number one, God says, eat and rest. Come on, somebody say amen. Hey, that's a good recipe right there. Eat and rest. And rest. God gets really practical with Elijah here. Look, guys, sometimes the most spiritual thing to do is rest. Sometimes that is the most spiritual thing to do. If you insist on continuing to do it all yourself and grinding and grinding and doing it yourself, think, and you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders, you know why? Because it is. You're doing it all yourself. You're going to continue to answer turbulence. You're going to continue to have anxiety and stress because you're doing it all yours out, but you don't have to. God gives this prescription. A lot of people can try to give you prescriptions when you're going through anxiety. Here's God's pr prescription. Eat and rest. Look what it says here. Um, you may want to write this down. If you get tired, learn to rest, not quit. Some of you are chronic quitters. I ain't going to point nobody out. Man. Don't elbow anybody. But you are a chronic quitter. Like you go through like commitment for a season, but when it gets tough, you bow out, whether that's on your own commitments, your ministries, your spiritual life, your relationships. And what you need to do is learn how to have a rhythm of rest in your life. If you did, you wouldn't abandon stuff all the time. You wouldn't quit things all the time. Jesus modeled this for us where he actually got away from the crowd. And he modeled rest and breath and catching your breath. Here's what God says to Elijah. It says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up. And eat. Told you it was in the Bible. Come on. God wants you to eat. Amen, somebody? He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him, and said, get up and eat. Come on. Doesn't that sound like a good day? That's a good day. Some of you need to do that today. The best, like, oh, the most spiritual thing you could do today is just go from, after this service, go get a good meal. And then take a good nap. And then wake up and eat leftovers. And lay back down again. <laughs> this is fantastic. I mean, this, is, I'm just, this is God's recipe. Like, he's come to the end of his place, the end of himself, and God's not like, pull yourself together. You got stuff to do, Elijah. Come on. Come on. Just start, Monday's around the corner. Go answer the emails. You know what I mean? No, God's like, no, no, no. Eat. Take a nap. And then get up again, eat again. It's fantastic. Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. You know, that's one of the most disobeyed commandments of God in the world we live in, is people don't rest. People don't honor the Lord with the Sabbath. Now, I'm not getting legalistic on you. Like, you don't need to, like, the, the, the law of the Saturday Sabbath was canceled in Christ, but... But the principle of Sabbath still remains. The principle of rest still remains. You need to rest. 
You need to have it. So what do we do if we're getting this place of anxiety, turbulence? You've ignored the signals and you're making bad decisions. Well, how do we get back to that place? Well, number one, eat and rest. Here's the second thing God did. Number two, God replaces our lies with his truth. Because we're just, right, we're, we're, this is the, where we're focusing on the negative, right? And we're calling things out, and we're just like, we got the wrong perspective. And what you need to do is get the right perspective back in your life. Because sometimes our anxiety isn't a result of our situation. Listen, it's a result of our thinking about the situation. Are, did you catch that, you guys? Because some of you think your anxiety is coming, it's situational. It's coming from those people, that job this season, this situation, and a lot of your anxiety is not coming from the situation, it's coming from the way you're thinking about your situation. And so what we need to do is invite God into that thought process and allow him to change some of those lies we are believing with the truth of his word. Here's why that's so important, because the voice you believe will determine the future you experience. And there's some lies and negative thinking that you're caught up in, and it's affecting your destination. It's affecting your future. It's affecting your, de it's affecting your destiny. Let's pick up the story. Verse 9. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. He said a lot of false things in that. Actually, if you go read it, I'm not going to read it to you. If you go read the rest of 1 Kings chapter 19, God actually calls him out on those lies and tells him the truth. Oh, I'm the only one. I'm the only one left. False. That's not true. I've been doing all the work. False. I'm the only one who cares. How many of you ever think like that? Wrong. Wrong. You're not the only one who cares. I'm the only one that can get it done. Come on, that's some of you. False. False. He owned more responsibility than was actually his. You can go check it out. God corrects it. I, I imagine, though, what God would say to us today with the negative things and the lies that we've allowed to sit in our mind and for us to repeat to ourselves. Like, like the, my marriage will never be okay. My marriage will never be restored. I imagine what God would try to change, how he would shift what you're saying about the narrative of your, your marriage. My kids will never come back to Christ. The doctor's report is the end of me. The, my, I'm always going to be alone. My husband or my wife will never come to you, Jesus. God takes those lies, and if you let them, he will replace them with his truth. There is no storm that God will not bring you through. There, there, is, there is no obstacle that God will not overcome. There is no enemy that God cannot defeat, and there is no hurt that God cannot heal. If you invite him into that, God will replace those lies with his truth. You take every thought captive and bring it to the obedience of Christ. See, when your, perspective, when your perspective is preloaded with the word of God, those lies lose their power over you. One of the best things that you can do for your, in response, not in response, actually pre-turbulence, is know and get into the word of God. Have a daily time. Know it, meditate on it, memorize it. Because if your perspective is preloaded with the word of God, when the enemy tries to lie to you, it will immediately confront his truth. And it won't take you off course. It won't get root in your mind. You'll immediately be able to cast that down. All right? So what does God do when we get to this place where we've had enough? Here's the third thing. God speaks in a still, small voice. You ever wonder why, like, God doesn't speak to us in spectacular, powerful ways? You ever want God to? Like, if God wants me to know his will and he know his real and know his direction, how come he just doesn't, like, like ex come in spectacular ways if he wants me to trust him and experience him? Here's what happens in the story. Verse 11, let's pick it up. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Oh, that must be God is in that one, right? That's God. He's in the wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. He wasn't in the spectacular. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper that the Lord was in the whisper. The Lord was in the breath. You see, when we're hurting, when we're afraid, when we're overwhelmed, why doesn't God speak often in times that are spectacular, that are 
loud ways. Why does he whisper? Write this down. God whispers, listen, because he's close. The Lord is near. See, when the enemy Shout, when the enemy tells you lies, he shouts his lies. It's lies of condemnation and lies of accusation. You'll never be enough. You'll never make it through. You're always going to be on your own. But God does not yell at you in your pain. He whispers at you. Not only because he is close, but he whispers to draw you close. He says, hey, come on. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm not far away. I'm right here. I'm always with you, even to the end of the age. And I'm good, and I'm faithful, and I'm for you, and I'm working all things, and nothing will separate you from my love. Nothing above, nothing below, no angel, no demon. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Why does God whisper? Because God is near, and he wants to draw you near. And then here's the, the last thing he did for Elijah. When you get to the end of yourself, you say, I've had enough. Number four. God gives us something to do. Hey, and this is really important for some of us today because some of you, you've ran so far from God's path and you have, you've like distanced yourself, you've cut people off and you feel like, man, what do I, I guess I'm, I've disqualified myself. No, actually what God wants to do is send you back in the game. He's got something for you to do. God gives us a divine assignment. Look at verse 15. And if we can get those keys up ASAP, come on, bro. There you go. First Kings chapter 19, verse 5. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. I felt the Lord saying as I was studying this message for us today, I felt the Lord saying, there's still work I have for you to do. Go back the way you came. Here's what he says. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, Anoint Haziel, king over Aram, also Jehu. Anoint Elisha. Elisha was going to be his protege, his new buddy, his new companion, to succeed you as a prophet. So here's what he, here's what he told Elisha. Elijah, go back and do what prophets do. And I believe that's what God is telling some of you today. Go back and do what prophets do. For some of you, are like, oh, I'm not a prophet. What do you mean? No, no, no. Okay. Go back and do, listen to me, go back and do what a mom does. Go back and do what a dad does. Go back and do what a spouse does. Hey, you've run, you've made some mistakes, you've made some bad decisions in the middle of your anxiety. I get it. But there's still something God wants you to do. Go back and do what I've called you to do. If, or if you're a business person, go back and do what business people do. If you, you got your person of prayer, your gift of serving, your gift of leadership, and watch. Watch as you do that, that God brings breath and life back into your situation. Go back and do what God has called you to do. You are not disqualified, you haven't run too far, and it's not too late. Can I pray that over you? Every head bow, every eye closed in this place. God, we just thank you so much. We need you. We need your breath. Today, God, we're, we're pausing. We're posturing ourselves to, to breathe again, to hear again. Some of you have ran yourself into the ground, <laughs> You've maybe isolated yourself, cut some people off, and today God is just, he's not mad at you. He's just calling you back to a healthier rhythm, a healthier life. He's calling you back to him. God, forgive us. Forgive us for not heeding the warning signs and warning signals and trying to do it all ourselves. Today, God, we just, we're getting back in alignment. We're rising above. God, I pray right now for the peace of God in the middle of our anxiety. The circumstances don't change, but my perspective and thoughts toward them can. The peace that I have in the middle of them can. So God, right now, I pray for the peace of God that transcends and causes us to rise above the anxiety that's, cause, that's causing us to make decisions that we regret and say things that we regret. God, right now, I pray. You're close. You're close. You're here. You're whispering for you, I'm with you, we're enough. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and maybe you've never even talked to God, prayed to God, never given your life to Jesus, that's what salvation is, it's where you just kind of surrender the control, 
Some of you kind of are like Elijah where you're, you're so far off the beaten path today. And you know you are. Like you know you're, you're far away from God, where God wants you to be. And the first decision to make to get back on God's path for your life is surrendering the control of your life to Jesus. For some of you who've never made that decision, I want to help you out with it. For others, you need to make it again. But here's what the Bible says. It's that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. Some of you need to make that decision right here, right now. Others of you need to make it again or for the first time. But I'm not going to have you come to the front or anything like that. I'm going to pray for you right there that, that today you'd accept it. You stop running from it. You'd surrender to it today. And God will do something new inside. The Bible says he'll give you a new heart, a new spirit inside of you. Put you on a different path. Some of you need it. Because you're running yourself into the ground. And it's not working. So if that's you and you're here, I'd love to pray for you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three, and I just want you to lift up your hand. <laughs> lift it real high if you're ready for that fresh start today. Come on. One, two, three. Lift up that hand. I surrender. I surrender control. Yes. All over this place. Leave it up. Leave it up. Leave it up. Yes. 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 Amen. 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 Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. All over this place. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down. Can I help you with the words to say? Maybe help you with this prayer. Go ahead and just whisper it right there. Say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins, my mistakes, and my past. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping running. And I surrender the control of my life to you. Jesus, I declare you're my Lord, my Savior, my God. I give you control. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Give me a new heart, new desire new thoughts. Set me on a new path, God. Help me to live for you from this day forward. God, I speak that over every person. God, that in the middle of our, our turbulence, that we wouldn't get caught in it, Lord, but we would rise above it. That we wouldn't just try to ride our way through it and continue to make the same mistakes. Say the wrong things and make some regrettable choices. God, give us your peace to rise above with rank power and authority over every stress and every anxiety we're experiencing in our life, that we would truly be anxious about nothing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, amen.